Ladies and gentlemen, for me it's a great privilege, honour and, and a joy to see so many of you seated in here today. I'm only sorry it's on such a sad occasion. Can I just check before we begin that you can all hear me? Yeah. Yes, if you can't wave at me and I'll adjust the sound level. Welcome to the West Kirk. Um, you will see from downstairs that we still have social distancing downstairs, though not upstairs. Um, and I would ask you that you continue to wear your masks throughout our service this afternoon. Um, because I'm standing here at a distance and where the tributes are offered and the singing, um, the people responsible do not need to wear their masks, but unfortunately, that's still the law at the moment, I'm afraid. This afternoon we gather. We gather as the family, the friends, the teammates and the colleagues of Ian Sterling. Today our gathering is one of thanksgiving and tribute for Ian's life. And it's a thanksgiving for the different ways that your paths have been entwined and crossed with his. We are witnessing to the part that he has played in all of our lives. Today is a day to acknowledge that in Ian's death we've lost someone who was significant to each of us. And at the same time to recognise the depths and the pain of that loss. But it's one of life's greatest tributes to be remembered well, to be talked about, to be loved just as much in death as in life. And so we're here not to speak in hushed tones, but to voice the ways that Ian was able to bring out the best in us and to share how much we admired and respected him. Often it's only when death is an unwelcome reality that we take the time to consider the breadth and the depth of the gift of life, the value of each day and its relationship that's formed. So today we're here before God to give thanks for Ian's life, to bring our memories and our pain, and to seek God's comfort and peace, trusting that Ian remains not just a part of his family, but of God's family and rests secure in God's safe keeping. And so appropriately, we're going to begin our time together this afternoon by singing the first hymn that is on your orders of service. It's a hymn which describes the triumph of the resurrection and our faith that with God, death is not the end. So we stand together to sing Thine be the glory.
begin our time together with a short prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you. We come with faith and doubt, with hope and hurt, and hearts still to be healed, but we come. God of the new and the old, faithful for the countless generations who've watched the sun set and rise again the next day, in your presence in this building and in the gift that is today, we come to remember, we come to give thanks for Ian Sterling, for his life, his loss, and his memory. O God, who stands with those who rejoice and those who mourn, we trust that you stand with us now in all the heights and the depths of life, and that there is no part of life's journey where you leave or forsake us. Be with each one of us now as we remember as we give thanks with the way Ian's life touched our own, as a family man, as a sportsman, as a businessman, as a churchman, or as a friend. Make our memories of Ian as fresh today as when they first took place, and inspire in us the zest for life and its opportunities that so often Ian grasped. Let your peace flow through us now, we ask, as we remember Ian's life in all its fullness. Amen. So in the first part of our service today, we're going to remember Ian's life through the eyes of his family. And so to begin with, I'd like to invite Peter, Ian's eldest son, to share something of his memories with us. Arbroath Football Club's feeder team, Arbroath Lads Club. A 
again winning many league titles and cups. Dad made his first team debut for Arbroath Football Club when he was 17 years old. And in his second season, when he was 18, he was the club's top goal scorer, scoring 20 goals in 26 league matches. Eventually, he had moved to his favourite position of centre half, and he became captain of the team at 21. As well as being supremely hard working and good at sport, Dad was also a great strategic thinker. He played bridge from an early age and was also a very good chess player, being able to compute future moves and winning strategies. His strategic thinking spilled over into other sports and businesses. Squash was a good example. He took up squash after retiring from football. He was self-taught and spent hours practicing. He learned how to play the perfect shot in any situation, but also how to disguise his shots. He used the warm-up period to probe his opponent's weaknesses and then form a strategy to best exploit them during the match. He rarely made unforced errors and ensured his opponent had to fight hard for every point won. He would intently watch his opponent to try and anticipate where they would hit the ball, and he'd already be moving there before they'd hit it. All of this required supreme concentration and focus, which few people could match. It's no surprise he became Marble's number one squash player and went on an amazing five-year run without ever losing a match. His last championship victory was in 1981, when he was almost 40 years old. After he retired from squash, he became a good golfer and tennis player. He'd always thrashed me at tennis, despite my best attempts. Even though I was 23 years younger than him, he always won the long rallies. The ball just kept coming back over the net despite what type of shot I played. Other, um, other players recounted that it was like playing against a brick wall. It wasn't until he was 74 that I finally managed to beat him. <laughs> Although his glasses were steaming up during the match and impairing his vision. But I still took great pleasure in the historic victory. He held out a bit longer in golf. It wasn't until he was 75 that I managed to beat him by one hole. Perhaps he began to feel a bit sorry for me in his old age. Strategic thinking, combined with supreme focus and 100% effort levels, was why he was able to read and play the game of football so well. As captain, Dad guided our growth to promotion to Scotland's first division in 1968, when it was arguably one of the best football leagues in Europe. Celtic were European champions the year before, and Rangers would win a major European trophy a few years later. Dundee and Hibs had great European pedigrees. Dad had actually played against Celtic at Parkhead in 1967 in the Scottish Cup the same year that Celtic were European champions. Arbroath were competing at this very high level while they were a part-time team, and all the players had full-time day jobs, painters, tradesmen, delivery men, etc. And my dad was labouring on his farm every day, usually working in the farm dairy from 4 a.m. My mum remembers him always rushing to change out his working overalls and into a suit and running down the farm road to jump on the team bus and off to play against a mighty team of full-time professionals. Alan Kennedy, a local businessman and one of Dad's teammates, remembers that on the team bus going to matches, a lot of the players would be playing cards and having a bit of a laugh, but not Dad. 
He preferred to discuss tactics of how they could beat their opponents. He was solely focused on winning the game. My dad always said he had to truly believe he could play that match winning shot, hold that long putt, or score that important penalty. Of course, that was the penalty taken for our growth. And to the best of my knowledge, he never ever missed a penalty, an incredible achievement. He used to say he'd worked out the hardest place for a keeper to save a penalty from a standing position, which was the furthest place he'd need to get to. So he always hit the ball low and very hard into the bottom corners. He was never put off by the antics of the goalkeeper, such was his complete focus. Although he always played to win, he was always humble and modest in victory and very gracious in defeat. He just liked to compete at a high level. Meeting and marrying mum when he was 21 was definitely dad's proudest achievement. He always repeated how lucky he was to have married mum. The best decision of his life, he'd often say. As kids, it was lovely to see how much in love they were. They went on to have seven kids and 18 grandchildren. He was also a very good breeder. <laughs> Dad was a real family man and fostered a close, happy family. Even after his kids had all grown up and had their own families, Dad would organise and pay for us all to go on an annual holiday to Mauritius. And every second Christmas, he'd rent a house big enough to, to take all 30 of us so we could celebrate Christmas together. His efforts have resulted in a tight, loving family. Mum and Dad had humble beginnings when Dad took over the family farm, Dick the Law. They were working hard in the dairy, long, hard days. The family car was a mini pickup. And when Dad arrived at hospital to collect Mum and his first newborn baby, me, a straw bale was stuck in the back broken window. The nurse recoiled when she saw bits of straw in the car as she handed the baby to Mum. However, with Dad's range of winning attributes, it was only a matter of time before he achieved brilliant success in everything he did. In 1968, Four years after their wedding, a local farm was up for sale and Dad saw his chance to finally expand his farming business and take it in a more professional direction with reduced manual labour. However, the bank manager just laughed at him and said he didn't have enough money and his own father suggested he buy some pigs instead. But Dad had thought it all out and was confident his business strategy was correct and the financials stacked up. So he persevered and somehow managed to secure enough funds via an insurance policy and bought the farm for £198 an acre. It's now worth a hundred times that amount, fully vindicating Dad's belief in himself. He wanted his children to succeed in life, so he made us work very hard. And he didn't want us to be brought up with a sense of privilege. So from the age of five, we were all in Dad's very and tatty buses, going around the town, collecting other people to work in the fields. We worked full days, nearly every day of the holidays, and most weekends, until we left school. Dad would go on to buy lots more farms, betting on himself, and each one becoming a fantastic investment. He'd also branch out into entertainment and leisure, developing a top cafe and wedding venue, the Meadowbank Inn. Also one of the region's best restaurants, the Carriage Room, one of the very few Angus restaurants to get, to get in the good food guide. He also built one of the coolest nightclubs in Tayside in 1982, Smokies. I had the challenge and pleasure of managing Smokies when I was not quite 20 years old. He 
He liked us to have responsibility at an early age. My sister Emma managed the Medibank Kid when she was only 18. On big nights at Smokies, like Christmas Eve, we would have around 1,200 paying customers enjoying themselves and around 40 staff looking after them. It was an iconic nightclub for many. As a young manager, for a few years I learned a lot. Like his sport, that also had an amazing business career. One year I told him I made a loss in my business. And he looked at me and said, Peter, I've never ever made a loss. Although it wasn't much consolation, it did inspire me to work harder. Dad racked up an amazing 59 consecutive years of making a profit in his business, right up until he died. When I occasionally asked him about it, he'd say, I'm just boringly good. <laughs> It wasn't luck though. He always said the more you put in, the more you get out. And the harder you work, the luckier you'll get. And always try and do the right thing. These were all great pieces of advice which have guided us through life. Dad always did the right thing and was always a gentleman. He took time out of his busy schedule to visit retired staff when their services didn't contribute anymore. He used to visit Albert Henderson, the old football club manager, in the nursing home and take him to watch football games. Dad was a church elder and did a lot, and did a lot of unsaid things for the community. He was a true rock and could always be relied upon. If he said he would do something, he could be counted on to do it, even in the toughest of circumstances. My father had retired from football for about six months, but during the run-up to Christmas in 1970, the club had a bad run of injuries to a few key players. <coughs> so he kept asking my father if he'd come out of retirement and play for them again until he got over the crisis. However, Dad was initially reluctant to return because his youngest son, Gavin, was seriously injured in hospital after a tragic accident and his spare moments away from work were spent at hospital supporting his son. However, the club kept asking, so he eventually said he would return and help the club in their time of need. The timing of his return could not have been worse. For only a few days later, on the 2nd of January 1971, his beloved son died of his injuries in hospital. It was the saddest day of my father's life. And at Gavin's funeral service, my father carried his small white coffin out of the service by himself. It was a terrible time because also on the same day as Gavin's death, 66 fans died in the Ibrox disaster. A few days ago, my mother gave me a copy of an article from the Dundee Courier, dated the 14th of January 1971, which I'd like to read to you. Perhaps you saw the service from Glasgow Cathedral in memory of the 66 fans who died at Ibrox. Yet last Saturday, there was a little ceremony that in its own way was just as moving. It took place not in Glasgow, but in our growth. Not in a cathedral, but on a football field. And it lasted not for an hour, but only a minute. Just before the match between our growth and East Fife, the loudspeaker announced a minute silence and a hush fell over the park. But one man there had his own personal tragedy to bear. Ian Sterling, our young captain. On the day of the Ibrox disaster, a 
his little boy, aged two and a half, died in hospital, unable to survive the injuries suffered in a tragic accident a few weeks before. As the silent seconds ticked away, you must have remembered not only the tragedy of Ibrox, but also the sorrow in his own home. And many of the 4,000 crowd were with him. The lasting memory many took away with them was not the match that followed, but of a tall young man, head bowed and shoulders squared, whose courage touched them all. <clears throat> Dad <clears throat> gave his all for the club. He played to win. And he was always brave, never shirking a tough challenge. He was hospitalized at least four times for head injuries, as well as broken bones. Heading these heavy leather footballs in the 60s gave him brain trauma, which eventually killed him with its resulting dementia. But he always said he wouldn't have changed anything, such was his love for Arbroath Football Club and the pleasure he got from playing with them. His devotion to the club was recognised and he held a minute's silence for my father at Arbor's last home game against Morton on the 18th of December. My father would have been very humbled by that kind gesture and even happier with the match result. Despite losing seven first, time, first team players to Covid as well as their iconic manager, Dick Campbell, Arbroath were victorious and won 2-1, sending them to the top of the league. An amazing achievement considering they were the only part-time team in the league. Mike Caird, Arbroath's current chairman, informed me that the great Sir Alex Ferguson had called Dick Campbell to offer his congratulations this tremendous achievement. And as they were talking, Sir Alex said, I remember playing against the big, tough, horrible centre half, Ian Sterling, and Dick had to sadly inform him that my father had passed away. Sir Alex and Dad were both 79, and in his playing days, Sir Alex was a tough centre forward, so no doubt they had some good battles together. Dad played for Arbroath for 11 seasons, the last seven of which he was captain of the club. He has the club's third highest league game appearances. Although he was seen as a formidable and tough centre half, he was never sent off once in his career, which just highlights what a fair sportsman he was. He served as the club's director and would go on to be club chairman for eight years. On the day of his funeral, the club kindly presented their flag to be laid over his coffin. My father would have felt so honoured. As my father was laid to rest, he was dressed smartly and was proudly wearing his Arbor's club tie. Ian Sterling was a true great a hero and a mentor to me, and a great friend to many, and he's sorely missed. How great thou art, Dad. Thank you. Ian described himself as boringly good. I think that what you've just heard from Peter would suggest that he was rather more than that. It takes a great deal of courage to stand up and to share the life history of somebody, but to share it in such a personal way. Thank you, Peter. And in response to that tribute, we're now going to listen to Elaine. She's going to come and sing a hymn, which was written uh, in the 19th century in Sweden. Um, and it's a response to a man's watching a storm approaching.
The storm sweeps across a lake and then moves on. This hymn reflects Ian's faith, describing the awesome nature of God in creation, something that he knew all about in his life at the Hebrew Law. But it also describes the confidence that God would return to carry him home. Elaine is going to sing How Great Thou Art for us to listen to.
everything. To complete the part, this part of the service um, led by the family, um, we're now going to have a short poem, May the Winds of Love Blow Softly. <coughs> Rosie, are you going to come out or would you like me to read it? Where is she? No? I don't know. May the winds of love blow softly. May the winds of love blow softly and whisper for you to hear that we will love and remember you and forever keep you near. Though his smile has gone forever and his hands we cannot touch, we shall never lose the memory of the grandfather that we all loved so much. Thank you for the years we shared, the love you gave, the way you cared. In our hearts you'll stay loved and remembered every day. And I think that sums it all up. Thank you. As we've heard, Ian was a multifaceted, multi-talented individual. And so all of you who've gathered here today will have known him in a variety of different ways. Whether you knew the family, whether you were part of the farming community, whether you were an employee from one of the many ventures, whether you were a fellow footballer, squash or tennis player, by the sound of things usually the loser in the game, whether you were a bridge player or a member of the church. However you have known you, you will have appreciated his love for life and for people, for the beauty of the land that he lived and worked on, and of his drive and competitive nature. So before we move on to our second tribute, I'm going to just read two very short passages from the Bible, which I hope capture these attributes. The first is from the Old Testament, it's Psalm 8, it describes the love of and the second is written by Paul in his letter to the church at Corinth, and I think it speaks for itself. Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, for you have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and inf infants, you've established a stronghold to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you care for them, human beings that you are mindful of them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honour. You've made them rulers over the works of your hands and put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds the animals, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. So Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And the second reading, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way then, as to succeed and get that prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. We do it to get a crown that will last forever. So I don't run like someone running aimlessly. I don't fight like a boxer beating the air. I strike a bow to my body and I make it my slave so that after I <coughs> preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Amen. And now for our second tribute today, I'm going to invite Will Porter to come and to share with us his memories of Ian, a fellow farmer and long-term friend.
Can you hear me all right? Yeah. I first met here when I think he was 15. I've been away in the National Services for two years. And I knew his brother, Alec and Ella, but I didn't know Ian. And he came up and introduced himself. He was a very self-assured young man, but completely modest. He, he wasn't obnoxious, and he remained the same throughout his life. Although he played football, he never told me about football. It was always about farming. He enjoyed the stock judging competitions at the old farmers club. But he wasn't a terribly regular member because he was always training for his football or playing in a game. But we enjoyed meeting when he did, and it was always a pleasure to meet him. He was consistent, he knew exactly what he would be like, and he was straightforward. His father obviously had a lot of confidence in him because from an early age, he had quite an important role to play at the law, which was a varied farm for, farm for these times. They grew fruit, they had pigs, and they had dairy herd, and of course they grew potatoes. Ian said he didn't have a fancy brain, but I could tell he had a very good brain. Uh, he, caught on to things quickly and he was very innovative. But obviously his activities were not limited to work and sport. He was, it was rumoured that his pickup was often seen in Strathmore and turning into the Nethermogi Road End. That was confirmed shortly afterwards when he and Flo announced their engagement. When Flo got back to Dickman Law, she, got into the, she, was, she got, went into the farmhouse and it wasn't long before with Ian's activity, babies began to appear. <laughs> they kept appearing. Fairly regularly. He was very proud of his family and very good to them, but he expected them all to toe the line. And Flo even would be helping him in the milking parlour with one running up the side passage, another there and a bump here. It wasn't unusual. At that time he was really looking to, to, to expand and to move forward. And when Bok, uh, uh, Bokhead came on the market, he managed to raise enough cash to buy it. Um, he, he realised then that if he was going to have a big unit, he had to have good men. And he was very good with his men. He had a good relationship with them and he could speak to them very friendly and easily. He, uh, he also commenced the milk bar at that time. And he, he developed it, but he didn't stop. We built it now a hospitality suite and then the carriage room. I always thought for a man of his financial ability, the carriage room wasn't very clever because he was always entertaining his friends there. <laughs> he thought he could make very much out of them. He was a very generous host, I can tell you. There's quite so much going on. Uh, his family grew up. He had daughters to start marrying off. And he did that with consistent regularity. <laughs> they, they got married and were, they were great weddings. I can remember the first one was at Windy Hills. I know the names changed now, but I still know it was Windy Hills. <laughs> and uh, he, he, uh, he had, obviously, he was a great host at weddings. But he started doing other things. He started going on holiday, which he had not done much with before. And he bought a timeshare in Portugal. And he got a lot of fun out of that, and with a lot of his neighbours who went. Of course, there was sport in it. There was golf, and there was tennis. Uh, he, he, um, also started 
put out fancy holidays because it was getting more prosperous. But this time they were farming about six farms and running them very well. It was because it was practical and it was a serious farmer. It wasn't a Mickey Mouse farmer. Uh, he, um, he went to Mauritius and took the family and that was a great success. He told me that he met Bobby Charlton there and he used to play golf with him. I've no doubt he gave him some tips about football too. <laughs> um, he said, I said, what was he like? He said, no, he said he wasn't bad. <laughs> this was golf, I mean. <laughs> um, but he and I used to play quite a lot of golf at Edsel. We, we did modestly in some of the club competitions. But a great thing was to play the Forbes brothers, John and Mike. Um, you wouldn't believe it, but on the way up, Ian was already talking tactics. How we could beat him. And he knew that Mike could hit a very long ball. But he was inclined to be wayward. Often Mike would be playing off not the next fairway, but the other, the other But he had an incredible ability to land the ball in the green from the third fairway. <laughs> these competitions, these games we had, were competitive because the loser paid for the supper. I think it was about 50-50. Uh, Ian, it hasn't been mentioned how much and how often he helped other people. He didn't mention it. He was always modest about what he'd done. But I know sometimes he let slip what he'd done. But he also helped people and nobody knew about it. And that was one of his great attributes his generosity and his kindness. Uh, he was aware, as an intelligent person, or anybody of his intelligence would be, that this football injury was liable to manifest itself in an unhappy way. But he, didn't, he, he did say to me a couple of times that he had put his house in order and things were organised. But as his health deteriorated, he was helped and supported at full was too by the family. They did a tremendous amount to help Florence. Also, his manager, David Martin, who took him around the farm and he, he did retain an interest until very near the end of his time. But his health deteriorated and it was only through the help of his family and the support that they gave him that it was possible to carry on. Ian is now gone, but he's left behind a living legacy of his children and grandchildren. He was a big man with a big heart. I was proud to be a friend of him, but proudest of all to call him my friend.
We give thanks that you have created us with hearts to feel and hands to touch. And so we come today thankful for the kindness that we have known at Ian's hands, for his caring words and actions to us and the place he holds in our own hearts. And we come thankful for that which we do not know, which is the unsung kindness of Ian. We bless you for the changing beauty that we see in creation. And we remember the different seasons in Ian's and in our own lives. And we remember that you have been there, a constant and unchanging present. As we thank you for Ian Sterling, for his part in your creation and for the ways as a family man, as a farmer, as a footballer, in the many different aspects of his personal, sporting and business life, we thank you for the ways in which he brought colour to our own. May we learn from his love for life, this local area that he was born and brought up in, his capacity to fill each day with energy, enthusiasm and commitment to work, to sport, to his family for his care and concern for others, always regarding everyone in the same way, and his unshakable faith that provided strength in the dark times. Knowing how keenly his loss is felt in the days of sorrow that lie ahead, we pray for Florence, for Ian's children, Peter, Lisa, Emma, Katie, Guy, Nikki, his grandchildren, and all the extended family, May they continue to know your strength, O oh God, and our support, so that in time, tears may give way to smiles, not because Ian's loss is felt any less, but because we remember and we give thanks and rejoice together that we were privileged to know him. We offer this prayer along with the unspoken prayers of our hearts and minds. In the name of the one who brought light out of darkness, the light which remains now and forevermore. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing our second hymn, Amazing Grace?
and well known, but also personal and individual. May the time that lies ahead be a further opportunity to continue to share our thoughts and memories with one another, keeping our love for Ian alive. We bless you for the gift of life which remains, and we pray that you will lead us forward to live in love and compassion with one another. So go now, go with your memories of Ian, memories to be shared, cherished, and enjoyed. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Spirit be yours now 